Hey gang, welcome back. If you are coming back, you're here for part two of the Matthew Cox interview. And like before, we just want to remind everybody that there is not only colorful, colorful language, but there's colorful content. And you might find it challenging, but if you're here for the second one, you must have been okay with it because you probably watched the first one. But we wanted to add this disclaimer for episode two. So it almost seems like an addiction at this point. Like, did you get a rush from surveying people and getting their IDs? Because like, you just left the police like coming after you and you pulled over to get more IDs. Right. But the, the police weren't on, they were, they weren't in cars, they were on foot. So they have to turn around and go back and get their vehicles. You know, the Starbucks people are, you know, everybody's on foot. It's downtown. I know that it's going to take them five or 10 minutes to get back to their vehicle, start their car. Like there's no, it, and you're not driving a red Ferrari or anything like no, that. I'm so you just like figure, a, it? But like just a, the, a the thought in your head, the thought in your head is here, I can get some more IDs. It yeah, wasn't... I'm going to need them. I'm, I'm going to need that information as quick as possible. So I pull over, I survey these guys, I get their information, jump back on the interstate, drive to uh, Nashville, Tennessee, beautiful drive up through the mountains and everything. Yeah. Very nice. Um, and uh, I go to Nashville. I go to an area of Nashville called um, Green Hills. Which is where like all the uh, um, stars and you know country mm -hmm. stars and stuff they live there, so it's super nice. And as I'm driving through, there was a a guy who was actually just putting his. Well, it was it was like a duplex. It was like two townhouses, but it looked like a big house. So putting a house up for sale, or and I pulled in and said, "Hey, you, uh, how much?" And he tells me how much, and I said, "Okay." And I look at the place. I come back and I said, "Listen, I don't." Oh, by that point, by the way, so what I'd done already was as soon as I got there, I went to, uh, it used to be something called Kinko's. It's like a UPS yeah. store. So I pull in there and I get for, it was something like 25 bucks. You get like 50 cards made. So I had gone and gotten a, a, a phone. So I got a drop phone, you know, a little phone number mm -hmm. with a phone. And then I, I had gotten a UPS. It was actually like, a, it was like kind of like Kinko's or mailboxes, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But now they're all UPS. Um, so I'd gotten that address. And I had made up a fake company and I got a, I got a, a business card issued. So I've got like, like 50 business cards for 25 bucks mm -hmm. with a name, address, name of the business, everything, my name, everything. So I've got those. I'm driving around looking for a, I'm looking for a place to live. I see the guy putting the sign in the front yard. I walk in, look at the place. I said, it looks great. I said, listen, I said, I don't really have any traditional credit. I just got back to the U.S. I've been living. I lived in a little town called Dexter, England. I said, I work for, uh, I work for, and I hand, I said, um, a manufactured funding group. You know, it's a bank. We, we, we do leasing for uh, industrial equipment. And I said, I just got relocated back to the U.S. I said, so I don't really have traditional credit. I said, but I can give you a couple months deposit, whatever you need. And, um, and he said, he looked at me and he goes, eh. he looked at the car I'm driving. It's probably worth 60, 70,000. You know, I look, you know, where I have the, uh, um, three C's, you know, going for me. Right. So, um, uh, you know, uh, was it, um, uh, capital credit. See, I was thinking, uh, car. <laughs> I was thinking car, <laughs> like car, um, charismatic uh -huh. Caucasian. Um, so he, ah. so he looks at me and he goes, eh, he goes, you look like a nice young man. And he, you know, and he said, he said, I'll take the first month's rent and, and the deposit and a deposit. I said, okay. And I said, you know, you mind if I pay you in cash? I don't I don't have an open a bank account yet. I have a few things. Oh, of course. So I give him boom, boom, boom. Gives me the, gives me the, um, uh, the key. I go get my electric tur turned on my utilities turned on. I go and buy a bed. It's getting delivered the next day. So everything within a day, I'm completely set up. I've got, you know, everything's is completely set up. I go and I order the birth certificate. Well, I order the, um, I, I print out the, um, the application for a birth certificate for all these guys. I order all their birth certificates. I order their, their, um, social security cards. I order, I register to vote in their names. I all located at this house and that house or the, P.O. box or the, the box I just opened, which is not a P.O. box, the mailbox. Uh, mailbox yeah. So I order using those and, you know, within a week, everything shows up. And a few days after that, I go and I get a driver's license uh, in the name, driving a car that's want that they're looking for in someone else's name. You know, oh, whose car is this? Oh, it's my buddy. Here's his in full insurance. For, and they let me actually have to take the test drive. Usually I didn't. Yeah. But this guy had actually had his license suspended. It was like expired, really. But either way, it's been so long that he'd had a valid driver's license, even in the other state. 
that they made me take the test. So I had to take the test. And so once I get his driver's license, I then take the vehicle and I drive all the way back to Charlotte. I leave it in Charlotte long-term parking, go and get on a plane, fly back to Nashville because I didn't want the car found in Nashville. Right. Go back to Nashville, go to um, AutoNation, put down 20%, get a loan from AutoNation on like a some SUV. It was like a Pathfinder or something for like 20 grand. Um, actually, I think it was an excursion. Whatever it was, it was, a, it was like, I mean, that's how little like the, the, the vehicles or anything I bought. Like I have no clue what these, how much these things right. were or whatever. It was whatever. It was an SUV. It's decent. It was a starter car. So I got the car. I've ordered, ordered their, their um, credit cards are showing up. I turn around. I date for about six months. And then I go out because I have nothing to do. I'm waiting for their, their credits to season, right? Like I don't have credit scores for about six months. Mm -hmm. So then I turn around and I go out into an area called J.C. Napier, which is kind of like Ybor City, outside, just outside of the downtown area. So they're run down. They're next to the projects. And I go out and I convince one guy to owner finance three properties to me. He's an investor. And so you owner finance them in six months. I'll, ref I'll refinance them and pay you off. And I convince him to allow me to record the sales instead of at 80,000 and 90,000, let's record the sales at 210, 205, 190. Those are, aren't exact. They're mm -hmm. within a few thousand though. And then this woman's re renovating her house, trying to sell it for like 15 grand. I get her to sell it to me for 20 grand, but let me record the, record the sale at 160. So you're back up and running. I just created f uh, four comparables in an area of maybe two or 300 houses. And very quickly, I start buying other houses. Uh, I start buying vacant lots and I start refinancing. Now I'm refinancing the properties. So I refinance the properties and now I've got half a million, a million. I start building new houses. I started dating a girl named Amanda. And uh, we move into a house. Everything's going good. Uh, I date her it was about a year and a half for about, about, about a year. No, I dated her for about a year. I've been there about a year and a half. And, you know, we've got 20 some odd houses. We've got a bunch of vacant lots. We're building four new houses. We're building four new houses, um, renovating a bunch of houses. And uh, we find out, she finds out who I am, you know, uh, which was problematic. It caused an issue for a little bit. But, you know, I just trusted that she wasn't going to say anything, which was stupid on my part. Um, How'd she find out? Uh, she found out because uh, we had a, we had opened up several, you know, corporations and bank accounts. That's sort of, you know, I'm laundering money. And so one of the things that the, the attorney that had opened the corporations calls me one day and says, Hey, you were supposed to sign this and send it over. And it was, and I was like, Oh, I, I did. And she's like, well, I never got it. I was like, okay. So I called Amanda and said, go on my computer, print this document out, sign it. Because these were, everything was in her name, mm. sign it and send it to the corporate attorney. So when she does, she sees, she looks through my stuff and she sees one file that said letter to mom and dad mm. and she clicks on it. Now she knew I was wanted, but she knew, she didn't know my name. And I explained to her, if you know my name, if you start, if I find out, you know, my name, I'll just leave. Mm. No offense to you, but you'll tell somebody I would never do that. I would never. So she knows you're a criminal, but doesn't know why or what she you've knows done. That she knows it's not violent. She okay. Knows it's, she knows yeah, it's yeah. white collar. And her parents know something's wrong. Um, they lived in, in uh, Jacksonville and her father, or was it her mother? Her father was, I think her father was positive that I was in the witness protection program, you know, uh, which is hilarious, right? Yeah. Like, perfect. And, I, and me, the more I said, well, I mean, I, you know, obviously that's not true. You know, and he would just, we, okay. Anything else on my? And he's in Florida. Yeah, and I'm. He's in Jacksonville, though. I mean, I wanted okay. out of Tampa. You know, they're they the Tampa newspapers yeah. aren't. So yeah. he doesn't know. So, right. and it it doesn't matter. Like it, even denying it, even slightly, and I didn't deny it, you know, profusely. So it makes him even think it even more. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, with Amanda, she's like, you don't have everything. You have is brand new. You have no photos of your family, no photos of mm -hmm. children, no photos of anything. You talk about your family. You tell funny jokes and funny this. You never talk to them. So that gets trickles down to her parents. First, her mother says, I'm married. She's a girl on the side. Uh, that turns into he's on the run. No, no, not on. It was never on the run was never an issue. It was always um, witness protection. protection. Super funny. So uh, at some point she figures it out. 
doesn't say anything to anybody and uh but I'm, everything's in her name what's on the letter to your mom and dad i just it was like when i left i literally like just before i left i sat down and typed up a letter to my parents saying this is what's going on i'm about to be they're going to come and arrest me i don't want to be arrested i have no interest in spending the next five or ten years in federal prison um i'm going to go on the run you know i love you wish things had worked out wish i'd been a better son hmm. had you sent that i sent it yeah i mailed yeah. It to him so uh she sees the letter, but she doesn't say anything. She doesn't, you know, she's, I, I figure it out when I go to get back on the computer, I go to close everything out. And when you close everything out, it, the last few things pull up and I see letter to mom and dad. Well, I haven't opened that letter in years. Mm -hmm. You know, that I, the last time I opened that letter, I was in Tampa. And it's like, oh shit. I go to the search bar, click, oh my God. It's just one article uh, after another, after, I mean, wanted posters. I mean, just... It's so like, she started searching. You saw her spent history. hours was, reading oh articles. Oh my gosh! So it's funny. Like I walk out, like I'm in. I'm stunned. And she's making dinner. Hey, what do you want for such and such? And I'm thinking, <laughs> you're good. You're good. Wow. Like you, you know this, and you're saying nothing. And I was like, well, what did you do? What do you mean? What did you do? And she just boom bursts into tears. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. It was an accident. It was that was no accident, but. Anyway, um, she, I don't leave. We're still together. Listen, we were together eight months after that for eight or nine months. She never said anything. So, you know, things are going good. But what we find out is that uh, Dateline is coming out with a special on me. And although I, by this point, I'd been in like four, uh, sorry, Fortune Magazine had done an article on me, you know, like a 6,000 word article. I'd been in um, Bloomberg Business Week several times. Uh, that's actually the, the name of my book. It's Shark in the Housing Pool. The Bloomberg had run an article called Sharks in the Housing Pool. Hmm. And then when Becky, the chick Becky that yeah, I ditched, yeah. when she got caught, they they said the feds ran, reeled in a great white. Um, so, so they got Becky while you were still. Yeah, yeah. Like six months before I had been caught, she got caught. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I. Uh, so Dateline's coming out and she, Amanda's seen it. Like she's seen, like she went on a blog. There's all these blogs about how they're interviewing different people. And she's like, do you know a guy named Scott Cugno? Do you know this? Do you know that? I'm like, well, why? What's up? She's like, he was just interviewed. Like there, there's a whole blog about all these people that have been interviewed for a one hour special. They're coming out on you. And I'm like, oh shit. Now, mm -hmm. you know, the barista at Starbucks does not read Fortune Magazine, mm -hmm. right? He's not reading the the Tampa Tribune when they run articles, mm -hmm. but he will eventually see Dateline. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't see it when it comes out, he may see it four years later. People will see it. It or won't a commercial go away. for mm -hmm. it or whatever. Yeah. It, it won't go away. Well, my episode specifically, like, I don't care about a commercial, but something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like From so, piece. some guy you know is going to go, holy shit, that guy comes in here every Tuesday. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, I see that guy. Oh, that guy comes in every day and gets this. Or hey, that guy, like they're going to know. And I said, I can't stay here anymore. And so I end up, we end up, we start refinancing properties to pull out money. And so we're trying to pull out money and we, we research places that you could go, right? So we figured we could go to Australia. And in Australia at the time, if you came to Australia with like 200,000 and a business plan, they would allow you, and you had no, no, um, no record, right? They don't fingerprint you. You just show up with, you can go to the local, any local sheriff's office and you pay to have your, your criminal record pulled. So if I show up and I've got a driver's license in, in a, the name Walter Holcomb and a passport is Walter Holcomb, credit cards is Walter Holcomb. I have a, um, and my, I pull his, his arrest record and it's clean. And I've got $200,000 and a business plan they will allow me to stay, to live in um, Australia as a permanent resident alien. Mm -hmm. Now, I cannot work. I cannot take a job as a, uh, because obviously they want to keep those for Aussies. But you can start a business. I can start a business and I can hire them. So they want you to come here, spend yep. your money, open yeah. a business, yeah. buy property, live here. Pay taxes. Pay taxes, but you, can't, you cannot. And keep in mind, Walter Holcomb... It doesn't even live in a shelter. He stays in a tent behind the shelter in a in a forested area. Mm -hmm. So I'm good, and I'm not showing up with 200 grand. I'm showing up with millions. Mm -hmm. So we're refinancing property. We're pulling out property, and I mean we're pulling out money, 
Um, we've got a few months. We figure we got a few months. We don't really know, but we got a few months. And uh, the quick version is that I'm asking people to cash checks for me. It looks more, you know, if I ask you to deposit a check for 20 grand into your account and then you pull that money out of your account, they don't realize you're cashing the checks. Or if I ask you to go in and get a cash check for $3,000 or 6,000 and the other people are, and my, my, you know, I'm writing checks all the time, right? Our balances are, mm-hmm. so people are cashing checks. Well, one of the, uh, Amanda and I had a friend, her name was Trina. And Amanda asks Trina to cash 20 or $30,000 in checks. So she writes them out, you know, 5,000, 7,000, 6,000, just cash one every couple of days. We have a month. And then that sparks a conversation between her and Trina on who, who is, my name was Joseph Carter. Who's Carter? You know, it was, it was, it was actually, it was Marion Carter Jr. But it, I went by Carter. So she's like, who's Carter? Uh, and so she tells him like, what's going on? She's like, Carter, his name's not Carter. His name's Matt Cox. Um, Dateline's coming out. We got to get a bunch of cash out. We're leaving. So. One day I coming home and um, I pull up and I get out of my car and suddenly a bunch of uh, SUVs and, you know, pull up and, you know, and I'm, I just got out of my car. I'm like, what the fuck? Oh my gosh. And they jump out with their guns and it says secret service and they scream, get on the ground, get on the ground. And they push me on the ground and uh, pick me up and they walk up to me and they handcuff me. And of course they walk up and they've got a you know, a uh, clipboard and it's got my wanted poster on it, right? And they walk up and they're looking at me and looking at the wanted poster. And it's so funny because one of the guys is going, that's not him. It's not him, bro. Oh it's not God. him. And the other one, the other guys, he goes, it's him. It's him. Your name's Matthew Cox, right, Mr. Cox? And I was like, yeah, it's a, uh, I'm Matt Cox. Yeah. And I got to ask, so what's worked for you all along this process is staying with the story. Right. Even even when you're at the bank and they're kind of interrogating you, you stay with the story, and now finally, you realize. Oh, listen, we're like, done. Like ten Secret Service agents, a helicopter, five or six deputies that are that got that now are blocked off the the street. Like they didn't get this wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. me saying. But even at that, that moment, guy, you don't know why they're there yet. It. Oh no! When they grab me, like I, I'm almost when they. And all that happened is secret. Keep in mind, I'm number one. The Secret Service is most wanted list. Secret right. Service just showed up with their badges and the whole thing. I know it's me. That one you know? guy doesn't give you any hope. Like maybe not even, no, his... even for a second, I, I almost felt like you idiot. You know, like, yeah. sh- come on. Not just that. Keep in mind, they've already pulled out. Uh, they've already pulled out a. Here's the thing. I, I was living as Joseph Carter, but I also had documents. And they pull out a, a passport in the name Walter Holcomb. Because you're about to go to Australia. Mm. Well, and I wasn't going. I really wasn't going. I had it on me for another reason. Like, uh-huh. you know, it's too complicated. This will drag out forever. If yeah. I tell you all the yeah. things that are going on, it'll drag out forever. But I just happened to have it right. on me. And, you know, I'm driving a car as Joseph Carter. My house is Joseph Carter. Like, they pull out a, you know what I'm saying? They've already, you know, they've already looked you yeah. up as Joseph Carter. And now there's a, oh, look, it's a real passport. Walter Holt. Like, I'm done. It's a, I've got a, mm-hmm. I got my, I've got my, my um, wallet has got multiple different people's information. Mm-hmm. And normally I always had that stuff separated. I would never walk out of the house with anybody's information on me other than one person. Right. But the situation just happened to be an issue. There was an issue that had happened and I happened to have a couple doc- different documents on me and that's it. It's over. What was the feeling? Um, It was, you know, everybody always tells you like, you know, like it was like such a relief. You know, talk, talk to guys in, in prison and everything, mm-hmm. you know, and you talk to, you see these interviews with these guys, like it was such a relief because I've been living this lie and I've always been worried. And, you know, you always hear that. Right. And uh, it wasn't a relief. It was fucking horrible because honestly, being on the run was like probably the best up to that part of my life. That was the best part of my life ever. I liked being on the run. Uh, what? I, the adrenaline rush? The, the adrenaline, the, high, the... the adrenaline, the the idea that nobody knows who you are. You are 100 percent living by your wits. You're in the wind. And you're beating everybody. You're yeah. winning oh, every wow. single yeah. time. Right. I'm walking through passport control and they're like, you know, they're like, you know, uh, hi, Mr. Eckert, how are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm good. You know, you go to the Ritz and they're calling you by a completely different, you ever been to the Ritz? Yeah. Say you know how they, they know your name? Yeah. They're calling you, everybody, the whole staff is calling oh you my someone gosh. else the whole time. So you're pulling one over, you're, it, it you, feels yeah. good to. You walk into the bank and you hand them all fake documents. And they take them, they verify them, 
you sign some documents, they cut you a check for $250,000 and they thank you for ripping them off. Like there's no better feeling than that mm -hmm. in the world. You feel euphoric, you feel like James Bond, you feel amazing, you feel untouchable. And so I felt untouchable for three fucking years straight. So when this guy, you know, so it was a horrific, it was a bad day. Well, the adventure's over. Day. Like you're watching yeah, well, this huge adventure that you've been on. You're now not going to have that freedom. Yeah. Well, I'm also going to get charged with 26 years. And I'm also going to get charged yeah. and get a 26 year sentence. So, you know, I'm thinking I'm going to get 10 or 15 years. And the problem was when I got my public defender, she also was telling me, you're probably going to get 15. We're going to, we're, we're going to, we're going to, because I had a, a pre-sentence report that came out and said 32 years to life. Now she argued like that's stupid. What, what are you talking about? He, one, he can't get a life. And two, um, some of the, she, are we argue about the enhancements and you, they say, you know, like he owes 9.5 million. I'm saying you can't justify that. You don't have the, doc you know, so we are arguing about it. this is mm -hmm. months later. We argue about the PSI. We get it down to 26 years, 26 years and four months. What year is this? 2000 and this by this point 2007 i get arrested late 2006 but by 2007 i've pled guilty we're arguing so at that time in american history in the mortgage industry the it, mortgage industry is the villain that took down the entire right. world so it's slowly in 2007 everybody says 2008 financial crisis yeah 2008 but by 2007 by yeah. halfway through two, late six yeah yeah they're they're going there's signs there's an issue yeah there's an issue banks yeah. are failing at this right. point and you're the poster child out. for it mm -hmm. right and so i'm the poster boy yeah. of mortgage fraud you know even though what i did is a joke mm -hmm. you know it's nothing compared to what the hedges yeah, did yeah. and you they had a name you were the bonnie and clyde of the bonnie mortgage and clyde industry of, yeah bonnie and clyde of of uh, mortgage fraud or bonnie and clyde of bank fraud the poster boy for a identity theft the uh silver tongue liar um i've got my favorite quote is from my judge which said the scope complexity and nefariousness of cox's fraud is breathtaking Whoa. that's a great quote wow right like i mean <laughs> granted it's horrible it, but right. you know from my perspective if you're gonna lean into it it's a great quote oh i put it on front of my book um might as well be at the top of the mountain right <laughs> <laughs> um, I always wonder if he's, he's, uh, he's seen it. Uh, anyway, so yeah. So anyway, w eventually I talk him down to 6 million. I owe 6 million in restitution. I get him down to six. How million. much do you have at this point? And what, oh, two questions. How much do you have? Nothing. You have nothing. No, they took everything. No, no, no. How much did you have in bank accounts at the time? Uh, not a lot. Let's say half a mil. Let, let's say a half a million and I'm still refinancing houses. I've, I'm going to get two or three million. I'm going to refinance all these houses. I'm right. getting two or three million minimum. And what happened to the storage unit? Oh, or that all I never of your even, stuff. Oh, I'm sure that was in Houston. I don't know what happened yeah. to that. You no. never, you never found out that? No, it's just- Because that had all your identities in it that had- Yeah, but those aren't identities I'm using anymore. Right. I don't know what happened to that stuff. So you still don't, it could have been in storage wars at some point. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I don't know what. Once you go I'm three sure, months, 90 uh, days, they put yeah, their paperwork yeah, I'm sure, and they auction it all off. I'm sure Becky sold all that stuff. She oh, had the key to it? She, yeah. Okay. That's why I not, like when, during when we, when it's like, hey, I'm out of here. Like I never said, I'm, I want to go get my stuff. Like, right. I, I want to get away from her as quick right. as possible. I just wonder if they were watching that unit or if they. No, they, they grabbed her. I'm sure she eventually told them where right. everything is. They went and grabbed it. It got right. sold. You know, they, keep in mind while I'm sitting there, they, they started taking stuff out of my house like they're immediately showing up with trucks wow. and dragging stuff away had dateline aired yet no so you got not, arrested no. before it aired i got arrested before it aired it aired maybe eight months into my sentence and then so it aired once let's say it aired four or five months into my sentence then the u.s attorney asked me to be uh interviewed by them so they come in, they interview me, they recut the episode, and then they re-air it. So I'm watching it in prison with everybody else. No yeah, way. With all the guys. So movie night is watching your- Is watching me, yeah. So then, so that happens. And the U.S. attorney at that time said, look, if Mr. Cox does Dateline, if he's interviewed, we'll consider it substantial assistance, which means if you substantially assist the government, they will reduce your sentence. Mm -hmm. We'll consider it substantial assistance. My lawyer says, Yo, you got to do it. I said, okay. So I do it. And keep in mind, I've already been interviewed by the FBI Secret Service. And I've always been like, like, why hasn't anybody been arrested? Well, we're waiting to get you. Now we got you. 
we'll go ahead and arrest everybody. We've already put the case together. We know who's in. Mm -hmm. We've already indicted everybody. My indictment has like 14, 15 people on it. They're really? all unnamed co-conspirators. So you've got like um, uh, R L R, R Rudy Lewis R R L A will be R L A R L A. Then you've got like uh, D A W, like that's you know Dave Allen Walker. You know you got Rudy Lewis. You know R Knotts. You've got so I've got all these, but they're all initials. They're unnamed co-conspirators. They want to get me so I can just tie everybody together because mm -hmm. most of these people that have been indicted have all said, I didn't do anything. Matt did it, but they know that's right. a lie. Right. And they, you're on the run, so you can't defend yourself. Right. So they're all thinking, we'll just blame it on Matt. And they've right. never indicted us, so it's working out. Right. But the fact is, it's hard to explain. If you didn't know you did the loan and you got a cut check cut to you for $75,000 and then you blew all that money on a new car, some furniture, and a vacation. Mm -hmm. Hard to believe that you thought that that was a broker fee, mm -hmm. you know, and that mm -hmm. you you also signed a document and multiple documents mm -hmm. saying that you disclosed to this person that is actually a synthetic identity doesn't exist. So your lies, we don't believe, but we're going to let you talk. Mm -hmm. And you're helping us with his case, but we're going to indict you too, because we know when we grab him, he's going to bury you. And the first time you didn't bury anybody. I didn't, but oh, I know better by now. The second time. I know better by now. Yeah. So they grabbed me. I said, yeah. I said, oh, yeah, so-and-so did this, so-and-so did this, so-and-so they did this. Yeah, whose signature is that? Ah, that's Susan's, that's Dave's, that's this. So they're like, okay, great. Secret Service, FBI. I eventually, I'm interviewed. They recut Dateline, they air it. I go in front of sent to, to be sentenced. And the U.S. attorney says, look, my, my lawyer says, look, I'm going to win. We're going in for 26 years. But I'm gonna, there's a bunch of enhancements that don't apply. So when we're going to win these enhancements, you're going to end up with about 12 years. She doesn't win any of the enhancements, not one. Um, and I mean, you know, you don't realize that at the time you read the what the the enhancement and the examples of how it applies. And you think that doesn't apply to me at all. And then you go and she argues it in front of the judge, judge your honor. And she reads exactly how, how it's supposed to apply. And the judge goes, yeah, but you know what? I feel like he tarnished their name. Mm. So one of the enhancements I'll give you this is um, if you go, if you pretend to be the cancer society and you go and you go to people's house and knock on the door and say, I'm borrowing yeah. on behalf of the cancer society and they give you money, your fraud is one, of course, you're defrauding people, right. but two, you're using the, you're using the cancer society to furtherance of your crime. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't borrow any money from, from, I didn't do anything like that. What they're saying, what they were saying was. I said I worked for the Salvation Army, and that got these people. Mm. So the whole thing is that you're saying the Cancer Society, they wouldn't have given you money if you just made, they, you use a- Right. Credible organization. Right. Now, I could have gone up and said, I work for Billy Bob. Right. And we're just taking surveys. Here's 20 bucks. They would have said, absolutely. But I didn't. I said Salvation Army. And I didn't steal money from them. I gave them money. Mm -hmm. So the judge went, I feel he tarnished their name. I'm going to let that stand, that stand. Well, every time he did that, I'm supposed to get, you know, five years off. I don't. Next one, I'm supposed to get four years or three years off. I don't. Next one, I'm supposed to get two years off. I don't. So it keeps adding and add before you know, it's 26 years and four months, exactly what they, they asked for. Wow. So the judge says that. So my lawyer doesn't, she's, you know, was unable to uh, sway him. And uh, the other thing was I'm supposed to get a sentence reduction. Because I've one cooperated, and two, I was interviewed by Dateline. But mm -hmm. the U.S. attorney decides at the last minute. She says, "Yeah, that's not enough." Now, granted, he cooperated, but nobody's been arrested yet. Now, that's not my fault, right? Um, they and, didn't like you. No, and we were not. And yeah, he was interviewed by Dateline, but that's not enough to reduce his sentence. But you said it was. Yeah, I know, but it's not enough. Wow. We'll wait. They said, "Your Honor, we expect." multiple sentence reductions in the future. But for right now, it's 26 years. And he said, okay, 26 years. So first of all, she should, she's not allowed to say that. There's all kinds of improprieties mm -hmm. that, that, that she, she said that they just went along with. Not that if I even went back and did anything that that judge would have said, the judge would have said, yeah, that didn't really sway me. Mm -hmm. But technically, you can't suggest that I'm coming back for a reduction. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to even Theorize, because mm -hmm. he could, he does take that into consideration. And I know he does because later, when I didn't get a sentence reduction, he told my lawyer, 
I expect, I thought this guy was coming back for a couple sentence reductions. What happened? So, wow. um, so you're, you're, you get arrested, you get booked in County first, uh, and then you get sentenced in the sentencing. At what point do you talk to your parents? I mean, I've talked Did to my parents. Did they reach out during that time? I talked time? to my mom and dad, my mom and dad a couple of times when you I was on, two, three from... times when I was on the run. Like if I, oh, okay. if I went on vacation or mm -hmm. I was somewhere, I would grab a, a drop phone, you know, a, a burner phone mm -hmm. and get it and make a few phone calls. Um, and were they, I mean, were they saying, nah, hey, they, they, you know, turn yourself in yeah. or, oh, you know, my dad just yelled at me. Um, and then my mom was, you know, I just want to know you're safe and blah, blah, blah. So yeah, I'm safe. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, I end up, so I end up getting 26 years and I go to prison and then American greed comes along and they write me a letter and I call my lawyer and she said, I already got in touch with them. They've already talked. U.S. attorneys already called me. They want you to be interviewed. I said, yeah, but why would I be interviewed? They didn't reduce my sentence. She's like, Matt, they said it. There's no have a choice. Do it. We'll be able to use this. And she wrote me an email saying she will absolutely consider this substantial assistance. So I, I send me the email. She sends me the email. Okay. So I do it. Um, we go back to them and say, hey, we did the interview. It, American Greed came out. Reduce my sentence. And she says, that's just not enough. So then she comes and this guy, Jim Montrum, comes along and he contacts me. And I actually had gone to his mortgage school to get licensed. And he remembered me. Um, so he says, why don't you, why don't you come and uh, why don't we write an ethics and fraud course? Like the, the Dodd-Frank Act mm -hmm. has just been passed. Why don't you do that? I was like, okay. Um, so... This is weird. I'm going to say this real quick, okay? Because otherwise I'll get fucked up mm -hmm. and start crying. I'll still probably cry. Brace yourself. We've had a lot of tears on the podcast. Have you? Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't feel so bad, but I'm going to race through it because I know, you know, it's hot. Um, <laughs> you know, and we're... No, I'm good. Um, so Jim Montrum, when I took his class, I was still dating the stripper chick, right? Um. So he's, we go across, so, you know, it's, it's whatever, it's so many hours, you know, you take it. So the mm -hmm. first day you, we take the hours, the next day you go and you, you've, you've got an hour long, hour and a half to go eat. So, you know, you're in class, you go, like we go next door, Rusty Pelican or something, right? And we're eating and there's several people there from the class eating and Jim Montrum's sitting by himself. And I went, that's the teacher. And she goes, my girlfriend goes, I know. And I went, ah, he's eating by himself. She goes, I know. She goes, yeah. And I go, let's go sit with him. She goes, why? I said, I feel bad. And she's, and I'm not, I don't feel bad, bro. Mm -hmm. I don't feel bad. Right. So I'm not interested. And in, so it was extremely out of character me for me to feel bad that you're eating alone. And she goes, I don't, don't want to eat with the fucking guy. She goes, she goes, nobody wants to eat with the teacher. I said, I know. I bet nobody ever eats with him. I go, come on, let's go eat with him. I get up and grind. She's like, ah, shit. Like this dude's already leaving. So we get up, we go and sit down. I said, hey, can I sit with you? He goes, sure. He said, you're in the class, right? I'm like, yeah. I said, what's going on? He said, ah, he said, nothing. Um, what's up? I said, do you mind if we eat with you? He said, no, oh, that's great. I would appreciate that. Yeah, that's great. He goes, nobody ever eats with me. He goes, I've been doing this 15 years. Nobody's ever ate with me. Kind of like laughing about him. Like, right? So God. I said, yeah. I said, he said, yeah, absolutely. So what do you do for a living? Oh, well, you know, I'm putting wood floors and, you know, windows and, you know. And so we have this little chit chat, we talk and we ate, we ate with him. And then I end up taking the class. We take the class, everything. And he remembers me. He always remembered me. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm this nice guy that ate with him. Yeah. So Jim Montrum is watches, uh, watches American greed. And he goes, holy shit. Wait a minute. Like I took my class. I knew it. I ate with him. He sends me a letter. What? Can you come? Dodd-Frank act just spent, just went through. And I have to write a three-hour course on ethics and fraud. I would love to write it with you. He said, you're the only person I know that is basically, and there's like 14 different basic scams, right, for real estate. Mm -hmm. He's, you're the only person I know that's hit every single scam mm -hmm. out there. You're the only person I know that was a, you were a licensed mortgage broker, licensed brokerage business, FHA, VA, conventional. You know, he's like, you're perfect for this. And you have a huge case. People will remember you. I said, okay. So he flies out. I th actually think he drove, uh, went to Atlanta, meets with my attorney and the U.S. attorney. And she says, he does this. Mr. Cox does this. And I will absolutely reduce the sentence. I will consider this substantial assistance. Okay. 
He comes to the jail several times. I write all these art. I write all this stuff. It's like 9,500 words, write this whole course. He starts using the course. People are calling my ex-wife saying, oh my God, I just took my continuing education course. Matt's teaching it. It's all about your ex-husband. So, you know, um, we send a whole package to the U.S. attorney and she says, it's just not enough. Just not enough. She says, and so at this point, I go and look up what a substantial assistance means. Mm -hmm. This just doesn't make sense anymore. My attorney's like, Matt, I'm so sorry. She's crying on the phone. I don't know what to do. She actually was stopped by the judge at one point. He calls her into his chambers. He goes, Millie, can I talk to you in chambers? She goes, sure. Goes in the chambers. And he said, listen, he said, what's happening with the Matt Cox case? With Co the Cox case? She goes, why would you ask? He goes, Millie, he said, I don't remember the names of most of the people that I've sentenced. He goes, but you, you, he goes, I sentenced this guy to 26 years for a white collar crime. He said, and I thought he was coming back here to be resentenced. What's happening? And she goes, they won't give him anything. He's done this and this and this and this. And he goes, well, what's he doing about it? She says, well, what can he do about it? Can, can he, uh, should he file this? I mean, he goes, I can't tell you what he should do, but he needs to get back in front of me. So I've got nothing. Uh, I'm the U.S. attorney. We send her that. She says, yeah, it's not enough. And keep in mind, you know, I always get these guys to, well, I wouldn't have done anything. Well, I would have made him put it in writing. No, you wouldn't have. You wouldn't have done it. You'd have done whatever they told you to do. Because they're not, they'd say, if you say, hey, well, put it in writing, they go, go fuck yourself. Do the 26, bitch. And what are you going to do? What are you going to do? They got all the leverage. They got all the leverage. Mm -hmm. You got nothing. You take a shot and you hope for the best. That's it. And that's what I did. So we, I end up getting this attorney who's in prison. I had called, by the way, I called two or th three attorneys uh, in prison, uh, three attorneys from prison. I have no money. I'm just trying to get them on the phone. <laughs> Listen, can we file something? Can we get my sentence reduced? Oh, and they're like, you don't have a prayer. You're in the 11th circuit, bro. You cannot force them to reduce your sentence. But yeah, but I got this email and this email and this, and she told my lawyer this. And he's there like, I don't care. There's nothing you could do. They said this at my sentencing. It doesn't matter. You're done. Now, if we were in the fifth or we were in the ninth or we were, but we're not, we're in the 11th and you're just fucking done. Okay. So I end up getting this attorney who's in prison, who was a disbarred attorney. He's got like 20, 22 years. He's got 22 years. His name's Frank Amadeo. He's a, a rapid cycling bipolar with features of schizophrenia. He believes that when he's off his medication, he believes that God is talking to him and telling, has told him and continues to tell him that he is preordained to be emperor of the world. Oh, all That's right. That's a good gig. Yeah. It, it is. If you, if, you if you could pull it off. He couldn't. He, uh, he basically, semi-complicated, but basically ended up de defrauding the federal government out of $200 million. It, it's, you'll hear $180 million, but in the end, it ended up being 200 Regardless, a uh, lot of money. He plotted a coup in the Congo. There's a documentary about it wow. called Nine Days in the Congo. He, there's, there's articles, everything. Anyway, he gets 22 years, comes to prison, starts working with inmates. I go and I talk to him. I tell him, hey, Frank, this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, he says, I'm not going to let this happen. He said, I want to take care of this. He hates injustice. Um, he really does. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, I'm, you know. Yeah. Um, and he says, they asked you to do this ethic and fraud course. They asked you to do that. Like you gave them, you cooperated, but they never, and keep in mind the FBI has come to see me like five or six times since I've been in prison mm -hmm. to try to put these cases together. Mm -hmm. And she finally, the FBI agent that was going to put the cases together goes to the U.S. attorney and says, look, I got viable cases. And he says, it's too old. It's too old. It's five, four or five years old. Banks are failing right now. These, some mm -hmm. of these cases are four or five years. It's too old. Banks are failing. We got bigger fish to fry. We're done. Forget it. Yeah, but this guy's going to do all of his time. Yeah, fuck them. So that's no help. That doesn't do anything for me. So I go to Frank and I explain to Frank. Frank says, yeah, but they, you got an email that says this. You got an email. He's like, I think we can, we can, we can do something. I tell him about the conversation with Millie and the judge. Mm -hmm. He says, I think the judge is on your side. And I, I never got that impression. But he says, I think we can do something here. Okay. So he felt, we, we do a 2255 and he puts it together over the course of three to six months and he files it. And it basically came down to the ethics and fraud course. Mm. And, you know, the, the, the interviews were important, but the ethics and fraud course. Um, 
if I hadn't sat with Jim Montrum and had lunch with him, I would have never had my sentence reduced. Totally out of character for me. Just a coincidence. Just a random, unlikely, kind act from a guy that's a prick to just, you know, some guy. And I got seven years knocked off my sentence for that. Wow. So I come back from sentencing and I, there's a guy there named Ron Wilson. He's a con man from uh, South Carolina. He stole, I think the total loss is 57 million, but he stole two, uh, sp sold over a hundred million dollars, a hundred million dollar Ponzi scheme, 57 million in loss. So he got 19 years, 19 and a half years. He got 19 and a half years and um, we're walking the compound and he's cooperating against a bunch of his co-defendants and he's concerned that they're not going to reduce his sentence for it. He knows I cooperated. Everybody in the compound pretty much knows, you know, even though I'm not telling anybody really, but they know. And mm -hmm. Ron knows, you know, they, they picked me up and brought me back to Atlanta. I came back, you know, that just doesn't happen. Right. So, and I'm telling people I won my 2255, which I did win my 2255, but not in the way that they think. So, uh, anyway, he, um, we're walking around and he keeps saying, he's like, uh, oh, they're not going to reduce my sentence. They're not going to reduce my sentence. And I was like, why do you keep saying that? He's like, oh, you know, they they think I've hidden Ponzi scheme money. I said, well, you didn't. So don't worry about it. They'd have to find the Ponzi scheme. They'd have to pr prove that. Yo, you don't understand. Okay. This happens every two weeks. He, we have this conversation. So probably after a few months, one day, I go, why do you keep saying that? I said, even if they don't, if you cooperate with them and uh, with these co-defendants and they get found guilty, then we'll get Frank to file a 2255. He says, you don't understand. I said, well, what is it? He goes, can I trust you? And I went, probably not. <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> and he goes, I did hide Ponzi scheme money. I did. He said, I gave some to my wife, uh, not much, 100, 100,000, 150,000. I gave some to my brother, maybe 30 grand. That's it. Okay. So we keep walking. And I remember laying in bed that night thinking, is that enough? Did he just tell me enough for me to cut this guy's fucking head, clean off his shoulders, bury him and get some more time knocked off my sentence? Because we're not friends. I don't have any friends. And I want out of prison. And I was like, that's not enough. They didn't want to give me anything for mm -hmm. this other. And if mm -hmm. even if they go, what are they going to get? Less than $200,000? Out of 57 million. Yeah. Out of 50, that's nothing. Right. They're going to blow that off. What they're going to get, and they're probably not even going to reindict him because he's probably going to die in prison. He's got 19 and a half years. He's 65 years old. It's over. And you're going to indict his wife and his brother for holding some money? That's right. assuming his brother and wife give up the money. Right. They've already been interviewed and said they have no money. Now they're going to admit it because some fucking inmate in prison said that Ron said so? No. He's trying happen. to shave his sentence. He's trying right. to shave his sentence right. off. You can't trust me. So, okay. So I had been resentenced and came back, and my, my, my attorney had promised to send me a copy of the transcripts because I had written a memoir my memoir, mm -hmm. and I wanted to include some of the stuff that was said. And it's nice to pull from the transcripts. So I called my lawyer. This is months later, by the way. This isn't even a week later. This is like a month and a half, two months later. We've now had multiple conversations about this. And I call up, hey, I never got my transcripts. And she's like, oh, God, man, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I'll do it right now. It takes, you know, it takes a month or so for them to give me, but they're ready now. I'm sure they're ready. I'll do it now. I said, okay. Okay. I said, all right, I appreciate it. And she goes, well, well, what's going on? So what do you mean? She goes, what's happening? I said, like, she never wanted to talk to me. When she was doing my case, she didn't want to talk to me. She was being paid. And I was like, um, this was a different lawyer other than Millie. Uh, and I was like, um, nothing. I said, no, nothing. What I, did. I said, hey, you know what? Listen to this. Tell her what Wilson said. She looks him up and she goes, oh, this is a bad guy. Oh, this guy like ripped off like pension funds and, and churches. And I'm like, right. And she's like, yeah, let me look into this. I said, okay. I don't suspect anything. A week later, a, a CO comes up to me, a prison guard, and he goes, hey, Cox. And I go, yeah, he goes, you need to go to SIS. That's the internal like uh, investigative surfaces. And I went, uh, okay. So I go there. They open the door. They go, Cox, come here, sit down. I go, okay. And he pulls, he tiles the phone. I go, what's going on? He said, just, just, you know, just shut up. And that's, they just talk to you like yeah. you're a dog. They just keep your fucking mouth shut. Just, just hold on a second. Hands me the phone. Boom. 
hey, this is Secret Service agent, you know, so and so Griffin. His last name was Griffin. Uh, like, whatever. And I'm like, oh uh, yeah. He said, uh, I understand you know where Ron Wilson hid Ponzi scheme money. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I want something in writing. Mm -hmm. I want, you know. So we swap emails. He says he'll get me something. I already know he can't. But I know I still want something, an email, something. So we get on our email system, right? We have a special email system for inmates. So we start emailing each other. And then he starts asking me. He gives me a letter first that says, hey, that's from the U.S. attorney saying, if Mr. Cox helps recover, helps get either um, indictments or recovers a substantial amount of money, we will consider it um, substantial assistance and will reduce the sentence. It's the best you're going to get, you know. I'm like, that, that's really, that means nothing, by the way. But I've got so many examples of it uh -huh. at this point. So I was like, uh, okay. So I start talking to the guys. I email them, respond. He's asking me to ask Ron, ask Ron this, ask Ron this. I'm like, okay. You know, and that takes a week or so. You got to slowly, like, I can't walk out and say, hey, by the way, I was wondering, you know, I'm like, I don't even know who this fucking person is. You're asking me about this person. I don't even know who that is. I've never heard the name before. Well, ask him, what am I going to do? Hey, <laughs> you never told me what happened with John Smith. Right. Was he going to look at me and be like, the fuck are you working? Are you, are you wearing a wire? You're like talking to my chest. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, I got to give me time. So this takes place over the six months. There's like 150, 200 emails between me and the Secret Service. Wow. And they are, it's just, it's overwhelming. And then there's points where literally I'm saying, this is when this happened. I know that because this so-and-so, this happened and they sold this piece of property and it, it was, they sold it for 250000 they come back, they go, no, we would have noticed that. I said, we'll check again because he's not lying. I think he's telling the truth. And they come back two weeks or a week later and they go, holy shit, you're right. So-and-so's mother sold the property for $200,000. We totally missed it. And you're saying that's when that actually, yes, that's when that happened. Okay. What about this? So I'm like, boom, 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 this. I know that because it was the last day of the last, he was also on the city council meeting, last city council meeting for that quarter, blah, blah, blah. This is the day that happened. Comes back, boom, boom, boom. They're like, holy shit, you're right. She was there. She was there. They stayed the night together. We have the hotel. We have the, okay. Oh my gosh. So I put the whole fucking case together. I've all, I lay out everything. Um, finally, they go and they talk to the ex-wife because this is his ex-wife. And his big thing is he's afraid that the ex-wife is going to bury him because she's found out he was having an affair the whole time. Wow. So she hates his guts. So Wilson's wife is going to kill him, cross crucify him just because he was having an affair. And the brother, he said, is a good Christian. If they come to him and ask him twice, he's going to buckle. So I'm telling them this. He says, it'll buckle. So they go and they bring the wife in and she says, I don't have any fucking money. I don't know what you're talking about. They bring the brother in the next day and the brother walks in with $150,000 in cash and gives it to him oh and his attorney. Gosh. An hour later, the wife walks in and gives him fucking 300 and some odd thousand in gold bullion, silver and cash. Comes to half a million dollars. So they indict them. They re-indict Ron Wilson. He gets grabbed and first he comes to me and I already know all this has happened. I've gotten the emails. And so he one day walks up to me. He's like, you know, Cox, Cox. And I'm like, yeah, hey, what's up, Ron? You know, I'm fucking a little bit concerned. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm 45 years old at this point. He's 67, 68. I'm not that concerned, but you know. You never know. And you don't want it to get around. Right. Uh -huh. He may not beat the shit out of me, but four other guys right. hear it. They uh -huh. might beat your ass. So he's like, Cox, Cox. And I'm like, yeah, what's up? And he's walking towards me. And I'm, I mean, I'm thinking, fuck, if he swings, like what, what, you know, like I'm red. Mm -hmm. He's an old man, but I still don't want to get punched. Mm -hmm. And he goes, you're not going to believe this. And I go, I go, what? He said, they indicted my wife and my brother. And I just got re-indicted. I go, why? And he says, because, oh, uh, because they found the Ponzi scheme money. I said, where? And he goes, yeah, they, they recovered half a million dollars in Ponzi scheme money. They talked to my wife and my brother and they, they gave it up. My like, half a million. I said, I thought you said it was like a hundred thousand. He's like, ah, I didn't know if I could. I, I lied. I, I didn't tell you the right amount. I didn't know if I could trust you. And I was like, I go, Ron. Oh my gosh. My God. You can't trust me. So I'm offended. So he tells me what's happened. He says he's going back to court. He goes back to court. They give him an additional six months. Whoa. For 19 and a half years to 20. His wife gets probation and I, like 50 hours community service. So does the, the brother get something very similar. She gets a little bit more because she lied the first time. Mm. Brother walked in, boom, here. 
Um, and uh, I know that's not enough. It's not enough. Now, the Secret Service agent writes a letter, a glowing letter saying all these are because of him. And it's half a million dollars. It's mm -hmm. the indictments, everything. We we then, uh, the U.S. attorney, we write a couple letters. They ignore it. Then we follow I go to Frank. I explain everything to Frank. Frank files another. Frank's like, nice. Um, Frank files another 2255. The government comes back and says, we don't know what he's talking about. We didn't know Mr. Cox was. Listen, the government are such scumbag pieces of garbage. I mean, on every fucking level, I've seen so much fucking just utter. Oh. They wouldn't call it corruption, but there's no other way to put it. You know, they make the rules so they get to twist it. You know, oh, it was a misunderstanding. Oh, it was a different U.S. attorney. Oh, they, that attorney didn't know about that. Oh, the, the, the file wasn't properly papered. We didn't have that information. That's why I didn't know that, Your Honor. I'm a new U.S. attorney. That was with the oh. old U.S. attorney. You're just lying sacks of shit. So we don't know what he's talking about, Your Honor. But luckily, I'm able to send the email to the judge and file something else and then i'm able to and then they didn't want to give me the recommendation from the u.s attorney from the uh secret service agent so i file a freedom of information act i file for a oh my i start filing all these documents next thing you know the, the the judge is like listen give this guy an attorney and when i get an attorney the same thing that kind of happened last time she flies mm -hmm. down same thing i explain look i got this madman doing my paperwork he's got me back into court and the government ends up buckling and they give me five years off my sentence that's a short version. Mm -hmm. uh, I get five more years off my sentence. By the time that happens, I'm a, a year or two away. And you have to understand the whole time this has been happening, I've been writing stories. I wrote my story, which turned into a story I wrote for a guy named Ephraim Devaroli. Uh, Ephraim Devaroli was played by Jonah Hill in the movie War Dogs. Mm. Oh, yeah. So, so, Eph so Ephraim Devaroli, I wrote his memoir from inside prison. I've got a couple of guys into Rolling Stone magazine. I got a book deal for that. Got a book deal for Deverell. got a book deal for this other called Generation Oxy. They were in Rolling Stone. Ended up, uh, we ended up uh, optioning his life rights. I ended up writing another story called Bent. Get a deal for that. End up getting, I mean, I, I end up writing books. And then I start just writing synopses of stories. Because I figure when I get out, I'll start a podcast or something. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll do something. I don't really know what a podcast is. Because there was no such thing as a podcast when I first got arrested. Um, YouTube had only been out for an hour and people were uploading like home movies on it, right? Mm -hmm. like, like their vacations and stuff. Uh, and then in 2009, podcast became a big deal, but I'd already been locked up for three years. So just as I'm getting out of prison, guys are coming up to me going, when you get out, you got to do a podcast. I'm like, well, I don't understand. What is that? And they're trying to explain it to me. It's kind of like a radio show. It's like TV, but it's not. <laughs> so... Um, okay. So yeah, I'll, I'll look into that when I get out. So I get out, I end up getting, uh, you know, I, I, end up getting out and I go to, uh, I go to a halfway house and, uh, yeah, that's, you know, I initially, how much time did you total 13? Like... It's, it's like 12, it's 12 years and like 10 months. I just say 13. I rounded up. Nobody cares. Mm -hmm. So say so yeah, it's like 13. Um, it's funny. Cause when I first got out, I said 12 years and one of my buddies was like, bro, it's closer to 13. And I was like, yeah, he goes round up. So I, I'll <laughs> round up. So I was 13 years, you know, and then I went to halfway house. I, I met this chick in the halfway house, which is, uh, I ended up marrying her. And uh, she had done five years for a meth conspiracy. If you are watching this podcast and you're in the mortgage industry and you haven't checked out the Knowledge Coop, you definitely need to dive into the Knowledge Coop. In there, you will find content and community that will help you grow as an individual by learning everything there is to know about the mortgage industry. If you think you know everything, just dive in and take some classes because there's always something more you can learn. To be successful in this business, you've got to continually learn. In addition, if you're a company and you want to teach your people in your own environment, we've got that in the Knowledge Coop Enterprise Services. So reach out to us, check out knowledgecoop.com. Definitely join Coop Plus. Let's get back to the podcast. Okay, so I want to transition into, you know, really pulling some lessons from last time out of this, right? This is an absolutely unbelievable story. Like it is, you've been through a lot, just there's so much to, I'll probably listen to this. I don't normally listen to podcasts afterwards. I'll probably listen to this three or four times. Um, what I want to do is just kind of go back and, and think through what, what can we take away from this for, for other people? So I want to start with the easy one. Um, parents of kids, um, like you, when you were young, uh, what can parents do if, if they've got a kid that's struggling through school, if what, what could have been done for you 
that would make you kind of take different paths in life? Um, how could your parents have have done something different or people around you? Is there any any takeaways there? I've never even thought about that. I mean, I just, you know, it 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 is what it is. You know what I mean? Like I don't I haven't thought about I mean, I think my parents did the best they could, you know. My dad's got his own his own issues. You know, my mom's trying to hold together a family. Mm-hmm. Nobody really knows what they're doing, you know. When you're a kid, you think your parents know know what's going on, but you get older and you realize God, you guys were winging it, weren't you? Mm-hmm. Um I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, my dad, you know, it, it wasn't super supportive, but I don't know that that was going to change anything. Um, I don't think that those things that happened in my childhood were led me necessarily to doing the things that I did. Like, I, I wish I had a better answer. Maybe I should mm. think about it more, but I don't, you know, although I can look at those things, I, I certainly don't think that my father, um, said things that he thought were going to push me in one direction or another. Um, And I don't know. And then the the, the problem is you could take probably 50 or 100 or 2,000 kids and put them in my exact same situation and they wouldn't have chosen the same path I took. Mm -hmm. So there's a hard, you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. there was something that was, I was partially predisposition to make those decisions. Other kids might have said, well, I'm not going to try and impress my father. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. You know, and, and I don't know how much of it was greed and how much of it was impressing my father and how much of it was adrenaline. And I'm sorry, that's, that's a good question. I just don't have a good answer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, how much of it was this? You, I keep going back to what you said earlier. How much of it was what your father modeled, which was make a bunch of money, you can do whatever you want to do. That, that had to put something mm-hmm. in your thinking that led to where you ended up down the road. Yeah, I rem- I do remember my dad. Listen, I I have so many of these thoughts that I never thought about really growing up. Although I kind of laughed about them growing up, um, but then later you you know I wrote, it, I didn't do any real uh, introspection until I wrote uh, my my book, and then you read you read books about r- how to write books, and they say you know you have to focus and look for these types of things, and so I never did that until I read several books on how to write a memoir. And uh, I just remember one time there was, um, and I've, I've said this before, but it's, it, to me, I look at it and I think, wow, this is like that was, is interesting. Um, we were driving, my dad had brand new BMW and we were going to do like our father son thing was, um, uh, it was like going to the movies. And most times he would just drop me off at the me, me movie and leave come back four hours later or something, you know, say, I'll be back here at four, you know, don't tell your mother, um, give me a $20 bill or something, which was like a lot of money. It's mm-hmm. like giving your kid a hundred bucks an hour and go, to go to the movies. Mm-hmm. So we're driving and I'm probably, I don't know what it was, nine, 10, something like that. We're driving my dad's new BMW and I have a little IZOD shirt on. My dad's in his suit and tie and we're driving. And I remember looking over at this car next to us and it was like a beat up Chevy Nova rusted out and i remember there were a bunch of kids in the back of the car you know they're like and they're looking at us at like a stoplight you know their dirty little faces pushed up against the thing and i just remember looking over at them and being you know instinctively being embarrassed Mm. because i could tell they were Mm. poor they had Mm. nothing they certainly weren't about to go spend the day at the movies um which i thought was great uh and i remember being embarrassed and kind of looking down and my dad looks over at me and he looks over at the kids, and I remember he looked back at me, and he said, I wonder what the poor are doing today. Mm-hmm. And then he just started laughing. And I kind of started laughing. I was like, <laughs> like, oh, my God. And I just, you know, and then we drove off. I remember too, he would he'd, you know, be smoking a cigarette, and he would blow smoke rings at my face, you know, not thinking it like now people would be offended. And it was, you know, it was funny mm-hmm. to me back then. And it was funny to him. It was funny to everybody because they didn't think it was that big of a deal. Um, and I just, you know, I remember thinking like later on, and I don't know that I thought that maybe at the moment, but I remember thinking that, you know, no matter what, it was always better to be driving the BMW than it was to be sitting in that Chevy Nova, mm-hmm. you know, that, I mean, I, I just knew that I just did not want to be in those kids position. You know, they were mocked and, you know, it was, and they were not spending the day, like I said, watching, going to the movies and eating popcorn mm-hmm. and getting a hot dog and drinking Coke and watching Star Wars. So 
and it probably was Star Wars, or it probably was 10 or 11, actually. Uh, yeah, but I mean, there's so many things. I remember one time I was worried, we were talking about me doing like what I was going to do when I got older. Like, I was like, what am I going to do? And he goes, eh, he said, you'll be all right. You're, you'll be able to make money doing something. He said, you, you'll, you'll be able to make money. You can always be a salesman. And I remember thinking like, I don't know that I can be a salesman. Why does he think I could be a salesman? And I remember asked him, I said, well, how do you know I'll be a good salesman or something along those lines? And he said, you know, he said, the secret to sales is sincerity. If you can fake that, you've got it made. He wow. said, he, was in, he said, and you've got that in spades. And I just thought, I don't really even know what he meant. If you can fake sincerity, sincerity. you've got it made. Oh my gosh. I mean, I, you know. I think you're accidentally giving us some answers to I, uh, what kids your parents yeah. have done differently. Because these are things like the value was on money. The value was on looking or being successful. Well, you know, the other thing, he, this is funny too. So my siblings, if we wanted something, they would ask me to go ask my dad. So for one thing, because I got very good at it. Because I, I remember like one time I went in to go ask my parents for something. Oh, a leather jacket. I live in Florida. It's a hundred on sale. Really a useful jacket. item. 150 yeah. bucks for a leather jacket. Okay. Stupid, right? Like this is 25 years ago. And so I go in, I said, dad, I said, you know, all my friends at school, they have leather jackets and then and I'm telling him, I'm all excited about it. And he goes, huh? He goes, hey, tell your mother to come in here. And I go, and I, she, well, she was, yeah, he was, tell, tell her about the jacket. I go, mom, all my friends say, you know, have uh, leather jackets and you can get them and they're on sale at JC Penney's and, and I'm telling them, you know, all about it. And she went. She looks at my dad and they look at me and they look, I mean, they look at each other and they just burst out laughing. And they're like, <laughs> my dad goes, tell me again about you, how you need a $150 leather jacket in Florida. He goes, what's with this kid? You know, and they're laughing. And I was just like, he's like, why, why, why? He said, what, what, why could I, would I possibly spend 150 bucks to get you a leather jacket? We live in Florida. You're going to live it. You're not even going to work. You're not even going to wear that thing for a week, you know? And, and, you know, things like that would happen. And I would think, you know, you know, obviously you're, you're I'm embarrassed and I feel silly. And, but there were times that I would go and I would ask him for stuff. And it wasn't always like that. It would be more like, eh, you don't really sell that. You know, what's the benefit for me to get you that? Well, uh, and then I would try and explain and it would be no good. Like I don't have anything prepared. So then I started realizing I have to have stuff prepared. Mm. I have to have this argument made yeah. multiple times. Listen, my wife has even said before, she's like, it's useless arguing with you. By the time we ha have the talk, you've already discussed it by, you know, you've already had it internally. She's like 50 times. Cause I do, I already have all, all my rebuttals ready. Boom, 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 boom. You're going to say this. I, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's funny. Cause that doesn't make sense because I just, back and forth, I, she's done. It's over. I stop. You're not going to win this argument. Um, and that was how it is. So I would go in and I would, my, my siblings wanted a pool. We want a pool. So I go in, my dad's not playing golf. He hadn't played golf in like two years. I heard my parents discussing it. And so I go in and I explain why we should get a pool. I'm like 12 years old explaining that it will increase the value of the house. You know, our neighbors have, have pools, but that's irrelevant. It will increase the value of the home. You don't have to pay for the pool up front. They go for about $12,000. This was a long time ago. Um, you can make payments on it. Uh, on top of that, you're you can you can cancel the membership at the country club. You don't golf anymore. We don't go to do this. We don't go to do that. That will pay for the, the, the payment for the club. Country club is $200 a month. That'll easily pay for that. I don't know any of this. I'm 12. You know, blah, 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 blah. We'll take care of the pool. We'll take care of the. You won't take care of the maintenance. I promise you we will take care of the maintenance. We will. We, I, will I will do the, you know, we'll vacuum it with the hose skim thing it. and skim it and all that. And, and, you know, and you need to talk about mom wants one. You know, I don't know that mom wants one. <laughs> um, but, you know, that whole thing, we end up getting a pool. You know, I end up, he, I remember he would tell people about how he picked up the phone one time and heard me talking on the phone. And he said, and I never listened to this kid. I never listened to it. I never, I'd hear the kids, oh, somebody's on the phone, you hang up, right? You know, this is the old phones you right. pick them up, mm -hmm. right? You, uh, he's too, uh, how old are you? I'm 49 years old. Okay, you remember. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I don't think my wife, who's, she's like 18 years younger than me, I don't think she's ever been in a position where she picked up the phone and somebody's on oh, the phone. Yeah. So, um, Anyway, yeah, so he picked it up and he heard me saying I was going to get a new computer. And the guy goes, your dad said you're going to get one. I said, no, 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 but I can convince him. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so, and this was like desktops had just come out. So, but it was, it was constantly. So I got to a point where I was very, very good at convincing him. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I would go in and I, when I, by the time I'm 16, 17, he's done. It's over. I'm walking in 17 years old. Dad, I need a new car. You're not getting a new car. Well, I do. I need a new car. And listen, uh, Reeves Import Motor Cars has a BMW. It's a three, it's $300 lease payment. Now, if you take what you purchased my car, if you take the, and I start going through, we just replaced the tires. We replaced the, this, we replaced this. And you divide it by, you know, by the last, you know, 12 months, plus the decrease in the insurance for getting a four-door lease on a BMW, brand new BMW that has a bumper to bumper warranty for three years, the same length of time that we'll have the vehicle, you're actually saving $45 uh, a, a month. That's, that's not right. That's, that's not right. Give me, give me the numbers again. We do the, all the numbers. He's like, that doesn't right. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. Are you, are you, are you, did you call so-and-so? I already called your secretary and Pam walks in. Pam, how much is the difference in the insurance? She's he's right. It's, the insurance drops down by about $400 a, month, a year. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't. Oh, by the way, I said, if you, if we sign within the next couple of days, I said, um, I think it was like, I'm like, if you sign on Monday, I'm like, they'll cut you a check for $2,500. What? I said, I already talked to him. I can't go there on Monday. I have stuff. On, right? And, and uh -huh. Pam goes, uh, you you actually don't have anything till one. I got Pam in on it with me. And he's like, yeah, let, me, let me think about this. Oh, yeah. Monday he goes and signs the paperwork. I got a brand new BMW. Saving the money. Um, I mean, like it was just like I was getting really good at, at, at you know, just because when I grew up, he would say it constantly. Well, you got to sell it. You know, that doesn't make sense. There's no benefit. What's the benefit to do that? Why would I do that? You know, you'd have to. So you'd go in there and I'd do the blah, 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 blah. So everybody listening right now is thinking probably what I'm thinking, which is if he would use his powers for good. I still wouldn't have made as much money as I did in fraud, but right. I wouldn't have had to go to prison for 13 years. And if you probably divided it throughout the whole thing, I probably would have made a lot more money. Yes. But would you have, have you thought about what would I have done differently I or think about it? Cause I don't want to, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure I thought about it for the first couple, two, three, listen, the first two, three years of prison, that's all you do is kick yourself. Nothing but regret. Really? It's nothing, but it's just horrific and it's complaining and it's denial and it's bargaining and it's all the things that you go through. Um, and you know, it's, it's, you know, all the, what are the stages of grief and, you know, you just, it's horrific. And then you get to a point and it's just, you realize it's useless. I don't, I, at this point, I never look back on what could have been never. Mm. That's just, that's just shortening. I think my life expectancy, I, I don't, I don't even think about what could move. This is what I did. This is what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. So I love Simon Sinek's whole, you know, his book he wrote about begin with why and you go through this incredible experience. Your dad clearly had some influence over how your thoughts formed and, and the um, relationship you want to have with him, his approval or whatever. How that all transitioned into the life you chose early on is, you know, anybody's guess what all the contributing factors were. But now you're here, you're on this podcast, you've been on maybe their podcast, you have your own podcast, you're reaching out to people who've been incarcerated, you're helping them share their stories. If you had to summarize what your why is right now, what is your why coming from where you've been to the work you're doing right now? What's your why? I, 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 I mean, you guys are, you, I, and I'm sorry, but this always kills me is that I, I, cause I have people reach out to me all the time telling me how inspirational my story is. What an ins inspiring, you know, my trek, you know, my journey, my, this, my, that, you know, how I'm, I'm, helping people do this and I'm helping and I'm not trying to help anybody. Like if, if, you know, like if you're thinking, oh, well, I, I want to, I'm on a mission. I'm not on a mission. Like, it doesn't seem like it. No, I would, I, would, <laughs> like, like, I would not have said yeah, that. Right. I'm not in a bad way. Right. I mean, but you know what I'm saying? Like I, but people, when it doesn't, when they, when you get a letter from somebody or an email and I get them all the time, you know, I love your podcast. I love it. I love what you're doing. I love your story. Uh, it's so inspiring. Like I'm not trying to be inspiring. Like you'll, I've never made it any attempt to be inspiring at all. This is what happened. You know, this is where it, it led me. I'm not trying to say anything. I mean, I'm not saying that I don't say inspiring things, you know, you know, one of the things I always say is like, is that, you know, like prior to prison, I had all the money in the world. I had all these friends and everybody loved me and I'm dating women I shouldn't have dated. And I have friends that would go to the ends of the earth and we're vacationing and I've got money and I got cars and houses and apartments and oh, it's just amazing. And I was miserable. I was very unhappy. Um, I go on the run. I'm happier on the run, not knowing any of those people, you know, like that's a part of it. Like these people are gone and I don't miss them. And they don't miss me because they didn't really care about me. Right. 
And then I go to prison and I have nothing. I don't have anything. And all those people that loved me, none of them came to see me. Mm. Nobody came to see me. So I went to prison and I was happier in prison with nothing. I was happier getting out of prison with nothing. I thought it was a joke to start. I wanted to work at McDonald's. I made a couple phone calls. I figured, listen, take the easy route first. Call a couple buddies. Let them say no. The first guy said, no, absolutely. Come work for me. Yeah. And I was like, I'm, I was almost disappointed. I wanted to be able to turn my life around. And when I heard somebody complain, I wanted to be able to say, five years ago, I was working at McDonald's. I got out. Of, I was in the halfway house working with McDonald's. It had nothing. So you know what? Sorry about your luck that you're, you know, that you're. I would say this because this is something to have it. Um, that your, uh, your, um, your Hummer needs a new transmission. You know, God forbid it's eighteen hundred dollars. Oh, that's horrible. You have to put it on your credit card. That's so so sad. You know, because I remember I was in prison and my I called, called my ex wife and she was complaining to me that her husband's there the the um warranty had gone out and like a month later his transmission in his Hummer went out and it's eighteen hundred dollars and I thought. Like, that's not a problem. <laughs> yeah. That's not an issue. Yeah. I have a counselor right now that is going around checking everybody's locker. And you're only allowed to have three shelves in your locker. If you have four, he's taking the other shelf out and he's writing you a, an incident report. You lose your room and you lose three months of, uh, of, of commissary. Like, that's a problem. My whole life fits into a three foot by 18 inch by two foot, um, uh, you know, file cabinet, you know, locker. And you're upset because you have to put 1800 bucks on a credit card. Like, this is not a real problem. So, uh, yeah, I mean, like I, I totally was happier getting out with, with nothing and starting with nothing. Like I, I thought, I thought this is, this killed me. My ex-wife, I was going to see my mom. Right. And I met my mom's and my, my ex-wife had left her car somewhere. So I, I, and she had stopped by my mom's and she's like, look, can you take me to drop your, my car, get my car? I said, yeah, yeah, hop in. So I'm driving that car that I bought in the halfway house, right? It was a, it was a Jeep Liberty, right? Like it's a chip, chick Jeep. It's like 10, 15 years old. It's falling apart. And we're driving and she goes, she starts, she's like playing with the, the AC, right? To turn up the AC. And she's like, what? And it's blowing. She's like, it's not getting cold. And I go, oh, I said, you're hot. And she goes, yeah. And I, I hit the things and I roll the windows down. And she goes, what? Your AC doesn't work? I said, no, no, that's for rich people. That's for rich people. Keep in mind, she, last time we hung out, I'm, I'm balling. And she goes, she, and you know, she looks at me. She goes, oh my God. She goes, did you have no AC in Florida? I'm like, no. I'm like, right. And she goes, and she says, uh, she goes, can you turn the radio on? And I go, yeah, yeah. And, I, and she, she tries to turn it on. And I said, oh, no, no, hold on. Bam, bam. And I hit it. And it, the short, it has a short in it. And it, boom, it comes on. Boom. I said, what do you want to watch? She goes, are you serious? I said, I go, pretty cool, right? I'm like Fonzie, you know, from Happy Days. Like, you know, <laughs> you know, he hit the juice box. And she goes, she looks at me and she goes, wow, you have fallen so far. And I was like, I know, right? I said, it's great. It's great. And I didn't choke up at the time because I was laughing so hard about it. And I knew what she was thinking. And she's just like, holy shit. Um, so we're driving down the road. And I remember we stopped at a light. So we're stopped at this light. Um, and uh, there's like a homeless guy there. Um, and I forget, I kind of... I drove off or something. I forget we had seen the home. It wasn't, it wasn't that we had seen the homeless guy. That's not what happened. We had pulled up, but there was nobody there. But we pulled up and I had a bunch of uh, granola bars. That's right. I think the, the bottles of water or something were rolling around in the back. And she goes, what's with the granola bars? And I said, oh, I said, I keep them. I said, for like homeless guys and shit. Like if you stop, you see them. I said, like, they come up the window. Then I give them like a granola bar and a bottle of water. And she goes, why? And I went, because I'm two financial decisions away from being that fucking guy right now. I said, and I'm not going to give him money. Fuck him for money. I said, I'm not giving him any money. I said, but I said, that, that'll keep you alive another day. Something really beautifully and, and powerfully significant and, and the way you communicate about the people 
whose lives touched yours along the way. Going, choosing to go have lunch with a guy sitting at a table by himself and having that later come back to you in the future. And it actually brings you to emotion. Talking about right now, keeping granola bars in your car, which my mom used to do. Granola bars and a bottle of water. She'd drive around and yeah. if she came across somebody, she would she would give them a granola bar. And that perspective, so I, I get that you're not trying to uh, inspire anyone or reform anybody, but, but there still is this powerful connection with the humanity of others that that brings you to emotion when you get to when you connect with it that's yeah, that's very seldom it's only a few things i mean i know what you're saying but remember when we talked i said there's only a few things yeah but listen i'll tell you this when covid hit and remember i, I had mentioned uh blumhouse the deal mm -hmm. with blumhouse so we had one of those meetings my sister helen calls me up and she said matt i gotta tell you something and i said yeah what's up and she said, Katie, Katie's my other sister. She said, uh, you know, COVID had just come. It had only been around a couple of weeks. So we don't really know what's happening yet. Mm -hmm. Nobody, they haven't shut anything down yet, but you're hearing about it. I knew my sister had been sick, but she didn't want to keep, she went to the hospital. She, they wanted to keep her in the hospital. She didn't want to stay in the hospital. Um, so she had pneumonia, didn't know what it was. It was COVID. She went home. She died. Oh my gosh. And so my sister says, Katie died. And I went, she goes, we think it's COVID. And I was like, okay. And she said, I'm sorry, but I, I wanted to tell you, and we all need to get together and go tell mom. My mom's in a, in, a, in a nursing home. I said, okay, well, let me know when, and I'll be there. And she goes, okay. And so I hang up the phone. Five minutes later, I'm on the phone with, with Blumhouse. I have a 30, 45 minute meeting. I never shed a tear, nothing. You know, when my ex-wife sent me at, I was in prison, sent me an email, said, call me immediately. So I called her, hey, what's up? She said, oh God, Matt, I'm so sorry. She starts crying. I knew my dad had been sick. They, they you know, I knew he had had lung cancer. First of all, he smoked since he was 13, but you know, I knew he, they had, found some spots and it had been a few months and they were going to do this and going to do that and this and that. And, uh, and I, and I knew he was hospice. They were calling in hospice. And so she's, and they had called him in for like a day or two earlier and she's crying. And I said, my dad died, didn't he? Did, and she goes, she said, Oh God, man, I'm so sorry. And she starts crying. And I said, um, it's okay. He lived a long life. He had a good life. You know, I said, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure if he, if you were to ask him, this is exactly how he would have wanted to go out surrounded by his friends and family pump full of morphine. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, you know, and she starts crying even harder. She's like, I called up to console you. And she starts crying even harder. And I just kind of was like, it's okay. It's okay. I never cried, you know? So, but there are some things like the thing where these guys are sending me money from prison. Yeah. It gets to be all fucked up. Yeah. So there's little things that really just tear me apart and other things that I'm just, I don't feel anything, you know, like, uh, like the, um, the people will say, you know, Oh, what about your victims? I feel nothing. I'm supposed to have this horrific internal struggle and strife over, you know, these people, and, and I have like four victims, you know, like most of them are, are banks. Like I, I, I was over 50 victims, but there's only four individuals. And these are somebody, somebody that like, I convinced you and really didn't even convince you. I had a real estate agent that said, Hey, this guy wants to buy your house, you sell it for 225,000. He'll give you 25 grand. You owner finance 200,000. They said, yes, we met at a closing. We signed, I joked around with them, signed. That's it made four, three or four payments. And then one day the secret service shows up and says, this guy took out like five mortgages on your house. He's got like a million dollars on your house and he's gone with the money. And you turn around, you hire an attorney and you end up paying 10 or $12,000. I owe you $12,000 because it took you $12,000 to get, to get those liens off of your house and get everything situated. And, you know, nothing. I understand and I'm sorry and I wish I hadn't done that and I, I wish things were better and you know I'm making payments and but 
I don't feel anything. I don't feel horrible. I don't cry about it. I don't get upset. I don't get a lump in my throat. I don't get anything. Well, I get the sense from you that that would just be a waste of energy anyway. It's like what productive good comes from that. Right. But it doesn't do me any good to get upset every time I think about somebody sending me money from prison. You know what I'm saying? Or yeah, it just that's just somebody giving a damn about you and yeah, and, and from yeah. maybe unusual circumstances. People yeah. who might otherwise be classified as people who don't give a damn about much giving a damn about you. That that's meaningful. Maybe. But I mean I should but I mean I know that I should feel bad about that. Like I should feel horrible. I should feel horrific. Everybody else says I should. Eh, you know. So we've gone a few hours now. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, it's perfect. Uh you haven't mentioned your son. Yeah, because I always get upset when I talk about my son, you know? You avoid <laughs> We're not in therapy right now, but I'm like, you don't like thinking about some of these things, but that's the... Yeah, because I mean, yeah, just in, in general, I don't, you know, I don't like thinking about my son because, you know, my son doesn't talk to me, doesn't want to talk to me. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you know, he has a good reason to not want to talk to me. So it's not like I can really, I don't have a great argument with this kid, you know? Mm -hmm. And the other problem is that he's super smart. Right. Like he's too smart to be manipulate to be manipulated, which sucks because, you know, I'm super good at manipulating people. You know, you give, you know, with some time and, and, and pressure, you can get you can win most people over, but it's not happening with, with him. You know, and like I said, he's got a good argument like you abandoned me. You took off. Now, I've got my reasons why I took off, you know, um, and, you know. And then, you know, when I was in prison, you know, I feel like I tried to do all the things I could have done to correct the situation. He wasn't having any of it. And I have no doubt that that's a, a, a big part of his mother, you know, mother's influence. And then, which his mother switched, kind of switched teams on that when I, she found out I was going to get out. So now it's like, this guy's not going to get out when he's 60. He's getting out fairly soon. And it became, she tried to start getting my son, hey, you should come see him. You should this, you should that. But by that point, he dug in mm -hmm. and said, no, I'm not interested in seeing this guy. He's a bad guy. And, you know, now she went, came to see me the whole time I was locked up. Her new husband came to see me. You know, uh, when I see them, they say, hey, what's up? How are you doing? You know, we shake hands. Everything's good. I text her. We text, we joke around uh, all the time. So, you know, everything is good there. Uh, her family, everybody except for my son. And I feel like, you know, he's just made this his mission. And this is, he's, he's drawn a line and he's sticking to it. And, and, you know, I've made many, many attempts, but it's just not happening. Hmm. And I don't know, you know, I don't know what to do about it, you know, other than reach out to him every once in a while. And, you know, he, I reach out and I say, hey, how's it going? Uh, would you consider maybe us having... Maybe let me take you to dinner next week sometime. And he says, listen, you piece of garbage. Don't text me anymore. I don't know why you keep texting me. I told you it's never going to happen. When are you going to get this through your head? And then I text back and I say, I, I love these little chats that we have, you know. Um, and, you know, he's a ha, ha, ha. You're not going to win me over like you've won everybody else over. Mm. You're not going to fool me. I know you. I know this. And yet everybody that actually does know me thinks I'm an okay guy. You actually don't know me. You know, and then so I'll say something like that. And next thing you know, we're bat, 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 and I'm like, eh, and I'm, you know, and I immediately shut it up. I'm like, look, I totally get it. I understand. Got it. I'll reach out to you again. He's like, if you want to waste your time, you know what I'm saying? I mean, he's mm -hmm. just a little snide comments and it's just not happening. And, you know, I'll keep reaching out periodically. How old is he? Right now, he's like 23. Wow. So it's not, it's not getting better. Uh, yeah, maybe. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It was, I think it was on the Lex Friedman podcast. It was the very end when he said, do you regret all the things that you've done? And your son was one of the, oh, yeah. was the, the guy that came up when you said, yeah, that's, that's the big one. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, you always talk to these guys and they're all, you know, I, I talk to them. Of course, the guys I talk to want to, want to pretend they're super tough. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, I, I don't regret anything because it made me the man I am today. And it's like, yeah. shut the fuck up, bro. You know, like the man I am today is not great. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm 50 in tomorrow, I'll be 55 years old, you know, just getting off federal probation, no money, starting from scratch. Um, 
like that's a shitty position to be in. You know, uh, you're a felon. Anybody who looks you up is, is and I'm not even a felon. Like I'm an infamous felon. So, and everybody's always, you know, like, oh, well, yeah, but you've turned it into something. What choice did I have? Yeah. They always mm-hmm. think it was so dynamic and amazing. You turn this around for yourself. Like, bro, like what, what, what were my chances? Did you think I was going to get out, change my name and start, a, start some hedge fund or start a mortgage company? Like it was never going to happen. Like I don't have a choice but to lean into it. Mm-hmm. So what do you do? You lean into it. You make the best of it. And that's what I'm doing. How do you a guy not... with a couple more years under his belt than you, only a couple, but uh, I would say, yeah, you had choices and you chose something pretty useful, pretty productive, pretty beneficial. Whether or not that's trying to make a difference or trying to inspire, who cares? You did have a lot of choices. There were a lot of different ways a guy like you could have gone. What's amazing is that, what, what I do find amazing is that, is that I do get these people all the time, all the time. And I read these emails and I'm like, the fuck? Like, I'll read it to my, I don't even read them, bro. Honestly, I highlight them and I have, I have, uh, you know, the, the iPhone read it to mm-hmm. like my, I can't even read them, um, you know, to my wife who will just, she just smiles and she just thinks it's so great. And she's like, you know, you just don't understand. And that's really her thing. She's like, you just don't get it. You know, like you mean something to these guys. And, uh, listen, I have these guys on the, come on the program and they say that. And it's just like, Jesus. I, I, I cut them off. I'm like, oh, bro, 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 please, please, please stop, please. Let, let's go. Because I'll get all, I'll get all teary eyed and shit, get fucked up where, you know, or some, some woman who wrote me cause she spent, I forget how many weeks, you know, taking a chemotherapy unless she listened to all my podcasts, everything. And you have no idea that you got me through this and this and that. It's just like, are you serious? Like, come on. First well, of all, you don't want shit. to accept there's this. There's better it's shit so to listen to. Like, get your priorities but it's straight. So, it's so interesting. You don't want to, like, I've worked on accepting that. And I had the same conversation with a guy who told me that his wife uh, had cancer. We had a couple episodes with cancer. He said those got them through a lot of it. And I hear that and I just go, that's amazing. Like, I, this is the coolest thing I've ever heard in my life. It makes everything that I've done worth it. And you push those things away where you're like, no, 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 no. Don't, don't see me for the, the good guy that I am. I would rather play the Joker. Yeah. I like the Joker, you know? Wow. I love the Joker. I remember, it's funny, I was doing, I did a, Danny Jones's podcast, and I remember there was one scene where he was like, uh, he's like, well, did you have a plan? And I'm that, that <laughs> the Joker, where he goes, look at me. Do mm-hmm. I have a, do I look like a guy who has a plan? He's like, I, I, I'm, I'm just a dog chasing a, you know, chasing a car. Like I wouldn't know what to do with it if I caught it, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's like, I just, you know, to me, I got out of prison. I thought I want to start a podcast. The podcast I started, I didn't even, isn't even what I wanted to start. It doesn't resemble what I wanted, but it, it slowly happened. Things fell into place and this is where I ended up and it's how I'm, and I'm doing great. It's how I make money. It's how I pay all my bills. It's great. So, you know, I, I. And then these, like I said, these people, they come out of the, you know, the woodwork and, and I don't know, you know, I don't even know what to say to them. Uh, it's so funny too, cause I'm so fucking cocky and arrogant. And, and when they, and if the guy will just come up to me and say, yo, bro, I listened to your podcast. You're great. I'm good with that. Right. Mm. But boy, if he stops me for a second and starts to tell me, Hey, you know, the other day I'm like, oh, fuck. I immediately think, please stop, please stop, please stop. You know, st- I, I start oh. walking away from people. Listen, on my way here, two guys recognize me. And I could tell if something was happening in them and they were about to have this conversation. And I just walked away. I said, hey, man, I appreciate it. Thanks. I got to go. And just kept walking. Wow. It happens all the time. Yeah. Now, if it's just some guy randomly stopping me and saying, Hey, bro, I love your podcast. Like, man, you're fucking amazing. You know, then I'm like, hey, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. But I'll, I move on very quickly. It's, okay. it's interesting. Wow. It's interesting. There's this desire not to want, not to be motivated by making a difference or being the, the bad guy turned good guy and getting all that recognition. And yet you can appreciate when somebody says something nice as long as they don't take it too far. It almost feels like if somebody takes it too far, then you, have to you're you know who you were when you were doing these things and it's like that person can't accept any gratitude or any uh, appreciation or something like that and yet by just doing what you're doing you got out of prison and you're doing what you're doing it is having that effect 
Yeah, but I'm just I trying to survive. And, okay. and you were and survive. you were invisible for so many years. You played the role of everybody but yourself for so many years. And now people see you for who you really are for helping them. I'm sick of me. Um and honestly, there are people in this room right now, if they'd gotten caught for some of the stuff they did when they were kids, who knows where their life is right. and you're looking at one of them. Yeah. Uh, I just didn't get caught. And somehow in not getting caught, I managed to figure out, I don't, that's not who I want to be. And I, and I choose a different direction. But had I gotten caught, my life takes on a yeah. whole different defining path. Oh, listen, I, I, it's so funny because guys will reach out to me all the time or buddies will reach out and be like, Hey bro, you know, listen, and they'll, you know, where it's they're they're going to ask me to do something. Could you help me out with no, 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 I'm just saying, I don't give a fuck, bro. Like if you think you, if you think that I'm going to risk what I've got, you know, I can't get in front of the judge again. Mm -hmm. That dude will put me in prison for the rest of my life and I'll have it coming. Like, absolutely. No, no, no. If you've just held, if you just explained to me, I'm not telling you anything. Mm -hmm. I'm not having this conversation. I'm not giving you anything at all. You know, like, I, like, it, it, you, are you broke? You need money? Like, ask me for money. But don't ask me to act, try. You know, no, no. But if you just help me, that I don't give a shit. I'm not doing that. I'm not helping you do that. And I send money to guys in, in prison. I have guys that write me. Ask me to send them books. I send, listen, at least once a month, maybe every two months, I send out three or four books. I mean, easily send out a book a month on average. As long as they don't write a letter telling you how much you mean to them. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's one of the criteria. <laughs> yeah. Well, well one, what I was going to say, one of the guys is actually one of the guys that mailed me, like he mailed me a check. Oh, and he's yeah. like, he's like, bro, just tell me how much it is. And I'll, I'll, I'll print. I'm like, bro, I, I, the way I see it, I owe you fucking $600 mm -hmm. or eight. It's, that's the guy, $800. I owe you like 800 bucks. I said, I'm not. And I've, I've probably mailed him, God, four or $500 worth of books in the last oh. few years. But like, I don't know, you know, no. Nah. I always characterize, people ask me, you know, we talked about my podcast episode and if I could characterize my story in one phrase, it would be, I just figured out how to get back up. That's all. I, that, I'm not very smart. I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I just figured out that laying in the dirt wasn't going to get me anywhere. So just get back up, dust yourself off. Or it, maybe there's somebody nice enough to dust you off and move back forward. So part of the admiration that you're getting it's just uh, whatever you want to call it, game, recognizing game. I always appreciate, respect, and admire people who have found a way to get back up. And that alone is a powerful testimony to people who, for whatever reason, whether it's, you know, you're two years into cancer treatment, it's got another year to go, and you're wondering how you're going to keep doing this, you just get back up and you go do the next thing. And that's, that's, that's not a bad legacy. I, I would say it's funny you say, uh, uh, remember when I told you the guys that I, the, these two guys that I got into Rolling Stone magazine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mailed out seven or eight different, I, I wrote a synopsis of his story, like 6,000, 8,000, about 8,000 words. I mailed it out to a bunch of different reporters. A few of them came back, said, I'd love to do it. can't do it for like a year. I'm busy. Okay. One guy came back and said, hey, I can get on it right away. Talked to him. He wanted to send it to a, a online magazine called uh, Epic Magazine. Well, I can get it in Epic Magazine right away. Maybe we could option it. And I went, uh, I want it in line with Rolling Stone. Like I sent it to you because you write for Rolling Stone. I, I want it in Rolling Stone. He's like, yeah, Matt, it's, you, it's it's difficult to get something in Rolling Stone. I said, yeah, I, I understand. And I said, but I mean, like I can't hold the magazine that's that internet magazine. I said, it's, it's like a, I said, I can't hold a blog. And <laughs> I didn't know what a blog was. Like, oh, I mean, it, he's like, it's not a blog. It's a magazine. I go, can I hold it? And he goes, no. I go, and I'm talking on the phone and the pay phone. And I go, can I hold it? Can you send it in to me? He's like, I could print a copy off. And I go, no, 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 it's a blog then. I said, listen, I want it in Rolling Stone magazine. And I said, you know, you've you've written like four articles for Rolling Stone magazine. Like, can you bring it to Rolling Stone? Well, man, I don't think it, you know, it's not that easy, blah, blah, blah. I said, look, look, listen, listen. I said, you haven't even tried. I said, if you try and fail, we'll put it in the other magazine. I said, but you haven't even tried. I said, I don't have a problem with losing. I go, bro, I've been losing my whole life. I said, I have a problem with not trying. You, you mm -hmm. try it, fail, and we'll put it in the other magazine because it's always an option. But your op first option is some blog? I said, nah, bro. He goes, all right, man. He said, I'll, I'll call him. I'll call. We'll see. What, like, he just, I didn't even think he was going to be honest. I thought he was just going to say, yeah, I did, and I can't do it. And, and like two weeks later, he, he, I got an email saying, hey, call me. And I called him. He said, all right, 
they did it. They won in the Rolling Stone. It's like, I told you, wow. I told you. I literally did a video on that Friday of the guy who told me, I won't get mad at you if you, if we lose, I'll get mad at you if you don't try. You yeah. 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 I used to always, I always say on my podcast, like, like li losers have the best stories. Like nobody wants mm -hmm. to talk to the guy that went to, you know, grew up in a middle-class neighborhood, middle-class family, went to high school, did well, got out, got a, got a degree, ended up becoming a CPA. Now he has two point, you know, uh, he has 2.1 children, mm -hmm. uh, has uh, married his, uh, his uh, college sweetheart. Now he lives in a middle-class neighborhood and he teaches, and he teaches uh, s soccer. I'm not saying, like, listen, thank God for that guy. Mm -hmm. That's the guy that makes this country run. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the middle class. And, and I, 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 you know, super thankful for that guy. But he doesn't have a great story. Now, if he was a complete loser, dropout, drug addict, four fucking car chases, six bank robberies, complete disaster. Now, granted, every one of his family members, he has devastated. And he's, he's cut a swath of destruction through anybody who's made the mistake of pathing passing along his, you know, his path, um, you know, yeah, it's horrific to be in a relationship with that guy, but damn, that's a dude that'll do a podcast and you can't look away because mm -hmm. he's gone through everything and he has an amazing story. If he's made it back, maybe he's still going through it. I, I meet guys all the time who they get on the podcast and they kind of seem like they got their shit together. But as you're doing, going through the podcast, you're kind of like, uh, you're still kind of a fuck up. Like you're just, mm -hmm. you know you're 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 barely hanging on like you seem like you're okay now but it's but just because you've been working as a plumber for six months i don't know bro you seem like you're on the edge well there is no doubt this conversation has gone on for a long time oh. and i'm not bored i don't think you're no bored. not one bit nope however in the interest of landing the plane and moving us forward i'm going to ask you a question then kim will wrap us up with a final question my question's simple if people want to get a hold of you how do they get a hold of you what's the best way to get a hold of you oh i mean i i have a I mean, I'm on Instagram and, uh, you know, Instagram, YouTube. I don't answer TikTok. I don't even run that account. But anyway, basically Instagram and YouTube. All and, the socials. Are yeah. The and in the, yeah. you know, my, my email is not hard to find. It's in the description box. And it, it's basically inside true crime at gmail.com. And inside true crime is the podcast. Yeah. It's Matt Cox in, or Matthew Cox inside true crime. Like awesome. if you can't, it's no, I don't, if anybody's can't get a hold of me like they're not trying right yeah, yeah. Oh, if i type in m-a-t yeah. it's like matthew cox i'm like yeah, yeah there if ever is. there was a rhetorical version of that question right. it's with you right. as a guest but it's kind of our tradition so we always ask it give you a chance if there uh -huh. were some other yeah. vehicle that you use that you're trying to promote we give you a chance to promote it but uh, yeah my final question for you that we ask every guest if you were to go back to 13 year old matthew cox he's out there hanging out on the sidewalk and you run into him and you get to tell him one thing give him one piece of advice what would it be um man i don't think i could i don't know i i'd hate to say don't get in the mortgage industry but the truth is it would have just been in if it had been the insurance or banking or stocks or something it may have been the exact same situation i don't know i think it, it you know it's it's i think it's getting your priorities straight like you know like nobody, you've heard this, nobody's, nobody's on their deathbed and said, you know, I wish I spent more time at the office. Mm -hmm. I wish I'd made more money. I wish I'd, mm -hmm. you know, none of that ever happens. I wish I'd made enough money to buy a Lamborghini. I wish, you know, nobody says that. It's, you know, it's always like, you know, spend more time with your family and, you know, get your priorities straight. You know, those would be great things to, to do, you know, to end up basically end up being that middle-class guy that with the two kids teaching soccer. Mm -hmm. Like, wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. Well, man, thank you so much. You flew all the way out here from Florida just to be on the podcast and be in our CE this year. So we just appreciate you sharing your story. Much gratitude. Much yeah. gratitude. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yep.